This town meeting is called to order. Please rise for the invocation to be given by Mr. Phil Pacino. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <coughs> Let us pray. Tomorrow is Veterans Day. In honor of the day, we recognize all the veterans who fought for our right to live in this democracy we call America. We particularly recognize and thank all the soldiers, sailors, Marines, and pilots who fought in World War, I, World War II in both Europe and in the Pacific. We also recognize the wounded warriors who sacrificed for this country those who got wounded both physically and mentally, and we pray for their well-being. But now we turn to the purpose for which we are here. As town meeting members, we ask for understanding, guidance, and wisdom from the higher power that each of us interprets as being beholden to. We ask that our higher power shine light on us here. We ask that we use our energies to solve and not divide. We ask to see equitable solutions to issues we ask for understanding of ideas and values, particularly those that are opposed to ours. We ask for insight to help untangle confusion and the complications of the decisions we made, especially when we are faced with difficult and emotional decisions. We ask for strength when our efforts seem to be lost and we feel like going away. We ask for knowledge and understanding to see the truth about the issues, our surroundings, our town, and even the world around us. Most of all, we ask for a clear understanding of issues and the purpose of which we are here. We should build rather than tear down. We should reconcile rather than polarize. Help us by showing us the way to fair and equitable solutions and actions. We ask that all these requests be granted unto us. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Monter. I ask for a, a mo moment of personal privilege. Um, last Friday, uh, Reading lost one of its pillars, one of its columns, and Jerry Fiore, who passed away. Uh, Jerry was a town meeting member here from 1981 through 1993. He was also at one point an acting moderator, at least for three meetings, I understand. Uh, he was a member of the Finance Committee, at which point he was the chair. He also served in the original Charter Committee. Uh, he was a member of the Board of uh, Directors of the Library Foundation. Uh, he also was very active in youth in youth baseball. Uh, he plus, you know, on top of that, there was all many contr uh, contributions from his family. Uh, Jane and, and Jerry's kids contributed very much to this town. Uh, we pray for them. We pray for uh, both Jane and for the rest of her family. Mr. Moderator, I ask that we observe a moment of silence, please. Thank you. Thank you. Now the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will now read the warrant. To any of the constables of the town of Reading, greetings. In the name of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you are hereby required to notify and warn the inhabitants of the town of Reading qualified to vote in town elections and town affairs to meet at the Reading Memorial High School Performing Arts Center, 62 Oakland Road, in said Reading on Tuesday, November 10, 2014, at 7.30 o'clock in the evening, at which time and place the following articles are to be acted upon and determined exclusively by the town meeting members in accordance with the provision of the town Home Rule Charter. Mr. Arenas moves that we dispense with the further reading of the warrant with the exception of the officer's return. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? All those opposed? Please. Motion carries. By the virtue of this warrant, I, in September 26, 2014, notified and warned the inhabitants of the town of Reading qualified to vote in the town elections and town affairs to meet at the place and time specified by the posting of attested copies of this town meeting warrant in the following public places. Precinct 1, Warren Kilm School. Precinct 2, Reading Police Station. Precinct 3, Reading Memorial Light Department. Precinct 4, Joshua Eaton. Precinct 5, the Reading Library. Precinct 6, Burroughs School. Precinct 7, Birch Meadow. 
Precinct 8 Wood End School and Town Hall. The date of posting being not less than 14 days prior to November 10, 2014, the date set for the town meeting of this warrant. I also caused a posting of this warrant to be published on the town of Reading website on September 29, 2014. Thank you. Now just a couple of very quick announcements before we get going. First, I would like to try something new tonight. I'm going to ask town meeting's permission. For the past few years, the town meeting has voted to dispense with much of the reading of the motions. Usually what happens is a speaker will begin reading, a motion will be made to dispense with the further reading, we take a quick vote, then proceed to the discussion. I've since discovered that in towns where the motions are pre-printed and in the hands of the members, the motions are not read but put before the body by the moderator. In order to do this, I will ask for a procedural vote to allow this. In effect, we'll be taking one vote at the beginning of the evening rather than wasting time and interrupting the movers. If you should decide to conduct the business in this way, I will still expect the mover of a motion to read the motion if there are changes from what appears in the printed document. We would also uh, make any procedural motions like indefinite postponement. So the motion before you right now is, it has been moved and seconded that the reading of main motions which are printed and in the hands of the members will be dispensed with for the duration of this town meeting. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Oh, I'm sorry, was there discussion? Where did I miss? Oh, yes. Ms. Snyder. Gina Snyder, Precinct 5. There was some confusion at the last session of town meeting where what was on the screen was not actually what we were voting for. So if we do do that, I would really like to have some codicil in there or something that indicates that what we'll see on the screen is the actual motion rather than some other description which wasn't fully descriptive of what we were voting on. Right, that's that a good point. That is what I'm hoping for. If it's different than what you have, it should be read, or at least it should be passed out. Any further discussion? And if this doesn't seem to work tonight, we'll, we'll revisit it at the next meeting. Any other discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, the motion carries. Okay, the second thing I'd like to say is uh, I'm going to lay out how I think we will be proceeding over the next two nights. We'll begin with Article 1, which is reports. Then we'll proceed through the following warrant for Articles 2 through 6. At that time, it is expected that there'll be a motion to take the substance of Article 9 out of order. The reason is that the main presenter is not available on Thursday. If the town meeting votes to take Article 9 out of order, we will hear that presentation, committee reports, and open the floor for discussion. And after that, either tonight or maybe more likely Thursday, it's expected we'll begin with 7 again and go through in the, in the following order. Okay, at this point, the business of Article 1 is now before the Point town. Of order. Point of order. Mr. Ober Mr. Uh, Ryan. All right. Thank you. God, the thing is working. And Thomas J. Ryan, Precinct 1. Point of order, Mr. Bartomato, I refer you page 36 in the white pages that was handed out with the warrant. <coughs> and uh, at the top of the page, it reads, uh, Rule 2, all articles on the warrant shall be taken up in the order of their arrangement in the warrant, <coughs> excuse me, unless otherwise decided by a majority vote of the members present and voted. Recently, I received an email from the town clerk dated November 6th, telling us what articles are to be uh, discussed and when. In my opinion, the town clerk has no say as to the agenda of town meeting. When I asked the town official this morning who were the anonymous we persons who decided the agenda, he replied that they were members of the community at large. I replied I did not consent to such an arrangement, and I resented the town clerk's intrusion into an area in which the clerk does not belong. His reply was, whether you like it or not, I really don't care. Town meeting is the sole authority that has to take up articles out of their order. Therefore, Mr. Moderator, at this point, I move to take Article 9 out of order now. Thank you. I, I had a little un trouble understanding. Did you just move to take 9 out of order right now? Is that what your motion was? I'm just checking. Is there a second to that? 
second. Is there further discussion? Yes. Um, <coughs> Mr. Greenfield? Yes. I'm not clear on the procedure, but I would like to counter move to keep things in order and to have nine follow as you had stated earlier. Okay, so that's not a second motion, but you're, you're uh, speaking in against <coughs> this latest motion. Yes. Further discussion? Yes, on the edge, Mr. Mon. Uh, Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Just clarification, I, I'm confused. Is the motion to take number article number nine in order or out of order? He, he wants to take it out of order and, and have it before the body right now. So have it the first article yes, discussed. Yes, before reports, everything, yes. Th thank you. Okay. Further discussion? None appearing. All those in favor of placing Article 9 before the body immediately, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion does not carry. We'll proceed to Article 1, reports. Ms. O'Brien. Good evening. Colleen O'Brien, General Manager for your Public Power Light Department. First, I would like to thank the town meeting and the town manager, Bob LaRochere, for allowing RMLD to provide our annual report to the town meeting members in a digital format. Reducing paper aligns with our goals of efficiency. To successfully meet the challenges of the electric utility industry, the RMLD is transitioning from being a reactive operations to a proactive operations. Over the past year, we have been conducting assessments and developing a strong six-year financial power supply and rate plan, along with calling for short and long-term strategic plans. Be efficient, be greener, go paperless speaks to improving each of our internal and external business and engineering processes, our electrical system, and how we communicate to our customers. Be efficient. Achieve maximum productivity and system efficiency with minimum wasted effort or expense. Get greener. Preserve the environment through non-polluting and energy-saving measures. Go paperless. Move towards wireless data for improved communication internally with our customers and within the electric system. <coughs> At RMLD, we are utilizing economic development tools to attract and retain customers, including new innovative programs for our customers that target energy rebates and opportunities to share savings when price signals during peak periods are high. Additionally, there are other projects such as joint venturing on solar panel projects, distributed generation, electric vehicle charging stations, et cetera. The flexibility of the electric system through optimal physical design and proper maintenance, along with integrating our geographic information system with our customer information system and outage management system, will enable the RMLD to efficiently communicate to our system, our customers, and we respond appropriately. A holistic approach to connecting the system, our power supply, and our customers through the implementation of strategic planning will work to ensure that we continue to provide one of the lowest rates in the state of Massachusetts and the highest reliability to our customers. We have completed and called for several large major studies to define and prioritize major facets to develop long-term strategic plans. For example, a cost of service study was performed last quarter resulting in unbundling of our electric bill to show transparency between power supply and operating costs, and will also pave the way for the future rate trends such as real-time pricing structures. If you haven't seen that, it's on RCTV. You can see myself and Priscilla and Jane go through how to interpret the unbundled bill. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, RMLD will be awarding organizational and reliability studies targeting efficiency and quality of service for a 20-year long plan. The organizational study will key in on organizational structure, associated work processes, business processes, staffing levels, career development, and succession planning. 
The reliability study will focus on improving system reliability by assessing the current system, anticipated growth in the system, technology adoption profiles, and investment decision making. In just one year, we have made tremendous progress in transitioning towards the necessary future alignment for the electric industry. We look forward to a very busy and productive FY 2015. I'd like to share with you a couple of slides, uh, um, which I won't take too much time up on, but give you an idea of what we've been working on. The RMLD mission statement, committed to provide excellent customer service, including competitively priced electricity as a result of diligence in the area's power supply risk management, system reliability and flexibility, and overall business efficiency. In FY14, we had a number of areas of upgrade in communications, organizational structure, system reliability, business financial, and efficiency measures. Just to touch on a couple of the highlights, in communications, we in unveiled a responsive communication effort where we're working with a variety of the towns with reverse 911 and how to get system alerts out to our customers when we have system issues, including outages. Under organizational structure, we developed the RFP and awarded to the long-term organizational study. In system reliability, we awarded that RFP for a long-term 20-year reliability study. We also implemented seven new predictive and preventative maintenance programs. Oh, sorry. Under business financial, we developed and maintained a six-year financial plan. And we continue to do budget to actual each month so that we can keep that six-year plan rolling. Under efficiency measures, we applied for and received the $250,000 LED grant, of which $150,000 will go for municipal street lighting upgrades, and the other hundred and fifty dollars will go to customer LED upgrades. Just some key points on the organizational study goals. Uh, both the organizational study and the reliability study will probably be done and you'll be having presentations for uh, staff and the Board of Commissioners in February, just to give you a timeline. This long-term study focuses on direct impacts to the overall efficiency of the utility within the contents of trends and best practices identified in the industry. You can see a number of the bullets that we'll be targeting. For the reliability study goals, we're identifying a 20-year work plan as it relates to current and future trending industry practices and standards. As well, there are some bullets of where we are focusing our efforts. Next, I'd like to talk just a little bit about the LED street lights. Um, the LED pilot started several months ago. Uh, there are 20 lights that were selected and ran through the town manager and town administrator for all four towns. We chose Cree lights. Uh, they were used in the, in the entire um, Cape Light Compact uh, that did all of um, Cape Cod. 25 watt LED lights would be replacing 50 watt, 100 watt, and 250 watt high pressure sodium lights. 93-watt LED floodlights will replace 400-watt high-pressure sodium lights. The pilot locations approved by the town manager and administrator can be found, well, for Reading, I'll show you on the next page, but if you are interested in any of the other towns or looking at the full pilot program, it's on our website, along with this presentation as well. In Reading, we have a 50-watt replacement on Cross Street, 100-watt replacements on Main Street, and 250-watt replacements on Haven Street, and 93 floodlight replacements at the town parking lot behind CVS Town Hall. We'll be working with um, uh, the town manager for a press release that will be coming out soon, and at that time, Bob and I will be coming up with a possibly an email address that we will be asking people to send in their comments on the lights. So stay, stay tuned for that press release. 
The last piece I just want to mention is the residential commercial charging station project. Um, we're offering rebates to customers who install level two 240 volt residential and commercial plug-in electric vehicle charges at their residence or business. Customers are reimbursed at 50% for out of pocket expenses up to $1,500 per charger. The residential customers charge vehicles at night, which is off peak under RMLD's time of use rate, which minimizes their electrical costs. Rebate applications you can find on our website, rmld.com. The charging stations are a pay per use um, and grants are available. So if you're interested in any of the charging station or if you're having um, you know, a solar panel project done at your home or a business or whatever, be sure to give us a call and ask for Jane and Integrated Resources. We'd be glad to help you or go over all of the programs and rebates that we have to offer. Thank you very much for all of your time. Have a wonderful night. School report, Mr. Doherty. Mr. Moderator, request an additional 15 minutes. Not appearing? Proceed. Mr. Moderator, town meeting members, board of selectmen, finance committee members, school committee, fellow town leaders and department heads, building principals, district administrators, members of the school community, and invited guests. It is with great honor and privilege that I present to you the 2014 State of the Schools Address. One of the duties that I look forward to each year as superintendent is to recognize and introduce to you the Reading Memorial High School seniors who are receiving the Massachusetts Association of School Superintendents Award for Academic and Community Excellence. This year, I am pleased to announce that I will be recognizing three award winners, each who have a strong three-year cumulative academic average, participate in extracurricular and community service activities, and are currently in the top 5% of their graduating class. The mandate to only select a few students is always a difficult one, given how many deserving candidates we have shining here at Reading Memorial High School. It is with honor that I present this award to the following candidates. Our first recipient serves in leadership positions as president of the National Honor Society and captain of the cross country and tennis teams. She is currently taking advanced placement classes in biology, chemistry, and statistics. Last year, she received the prestigious Williams College Book Award and is a National Merit Letter of Commendation award winner. She has put in hundreds of hours in community service as a member of the Leo Club and volunteering at Winchester Hospital and Massachusetts General Hospital. This recipient has applied to several colleges and universities, including Boston College, where she is planning on majoring in nursing. It is with great pleasure tonight that I recognize Kate Mignosa. Kate, please come forward to receive the 2014 Superintendent's Award. Tonight's second recipient has excelled in the performing arts as a member of the Reading Memorial High School Drama Club and as co-director of two elementary school plays. She is co-president of the Reading Memorial High School Choral Group from out of nowhere. She has also earned honorable mention at the Boston Globe Scholastic Art Awards. Academically, this individual has received a Merit National Merit Scholar Letter of Commendation and received the esteemed Princeton University Book Award last year. A member of the National Honor Society, this recipient is currently dual enrolled at Salem State University and is currently taking advanced placement and college courses. She also puts her learning and presentation skills to work this past summer as a tour guide at the State House. Next year, she plans on majoring in journalism. 
It is with great honor to introduce to you Becky Wandell. Please come forward and accept the 2014 Superintendent's Award for Academic Excellence. Our final recipient is a member of the National Honor Society and the Spanish National Honor Society. He is a participant in the Reading Memorial High School Drama Club and was the student representative last year on, on last year's Reading Memorial High School Principal Search Committee. Like the other two recipients of this award, this student is a National Merit Scholar. He is currently taking four AP classes this year, including BC Calculus, English, Computer Science, and Physics. He volunteers during the summer at Camp Sunshine, a summer camp program for children with serious illnesses. He has applied for early decision to the University of Pennsylvania, where he would like to study psychology and computer science. It is with great honor that I present the Superintendent's Award to Ryan Friedman. Ryan, please come forward and accept the 2014 Superintendent's Award. Congratulations to Kate, Becky, and Ryan. Tonight's sharing of accomplishments does not stop with recognizing these three students who personify the educational journeys which our schools strive to inspire, teach, and support. The main objective of this annual address is to report on the state of the schools, and without question, our school system could have no finer examples of its mission than these three outstanding students and many more like them. Schools across the country are experiencing educational challenges, and our district strives to meet these challenges with cutting-edge curriculum, creative best practices and funding, cross-staff collaboration and learning, and the tenacity which engages families, staff, and community in preparing our students for their world and the challenges that they will face. Tonight, I will highlight some of our accomplishments from this past year and share with you some areas that we are focusing on as we strive to become the best pre-K to 12 school district in our region. To highlight our successes, we have distributed two documents to you this evening which capture the 2013-14 school year. The first focuses on the accomplishments of our entire pre-K to 12 district, and the other, the Reading Memorial High School school profile, which is specific to our high school and is distributed to colleges and universities across the country. These accomplishments would not be possible without a dedicated and caring staff strong leadership, and a tireless effort from our administrators and directors and the financial and volunteer support that we receive from our parents and our community. It is this spirit of collaboration, commitment, and teamwork that helps contribute to the success of our school district. We have a lot to be proud of in this community, and we need to take the time to celebrate those successes. Whether it is our RISE Integrated Preschool, which does an amazing job with our three and four year olds, or our elementary schools, which are committed to building strong communities of learners in literacy and mathematics, or our middle schools, which have provided many powerful learning opportunities for students during a very challenging developmental stage in their lives, or our high school, which challenges our students so that they can be prepared for college or career opportunities. Our district is a solid example of how we are working together to instill a joy of learning and inspire the innovative leaders of tomorrow. This is evident with the latest graduating class of 2014, where 93% of the students are continuing on to post-secondary education, including 88% going on to a four-year college or university. They have excelled in state and national exams, such as AP and SAT tests, and once again, all of our graduating class passed the MCAS test requirements for graduation. In addition, Boston Magazine recently recognized Reading Memorial High School as one of the top 30 high schools in Massachusetts. <coughs> Another area that we are proud of as a school district is our students' access to technology. And through a series of funding sources and initiatives, including the Reading Education Foundation, Reading Cooperative Bank, and our PTOs, we have significantly increased the number of mobile devices and other technology at all levels as a tool to support learning. 
We now have well over 1,200 mobile devices, iPads, and laptops in our district. In addition, 50% of our middle school students and 90% of our high school students are part of a Bring Your Own Device initiative, which helps us get us closer to our goal of having mobile learning device available for every student. We have also strengthened our STEAM offerings, the science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics, by increasing the number of engineering courses and robotics programs offered at our middle and high schools. Students at Reading Memorial High School now have the opportunity to take engineering each of their four years. Both of our middle schools have science Olympiad teams, and all of our schools have robotics teams. Reading Memorial High School has a very competitive robotics team, which placed high in the first robotics regional competition and competed in the national competition. Our co-curricular and extracurricular programs continue to provide outstanding, enriching experiences with high participation rates at all levels. Our extended day program at the elementary now has well over 350 participants. Our middle school and after school programs are even more successful. Reading Memorial High School features 87 different clubs and athletic teams where over 85% of the students participate in at least one or more extracurricular activities. This past year, five RMHS varsity teams won Middlesex League championships and our boys hockey team won the Division I state championship. It is the third year in a row that a Reading Memorial High School sports team has won a state championship. Our fine and performing arts programs continue to excel with an outstanding elementary choral program, award-winning middle school and high school choral and band programs, a gold middle medal winning marching band, and color guard and an outstanding jazz band who last year was awarded the opportunity to play at the Hat Shell in Boston. Several middle and high school students received Boston Globe Scholastic Art Awards. Each of our middle schools perform a musical annually, and last year, Reading Memorial High School Drama Club filled up this fine and performing arts center with six different types of shows, including two musicals, two plays, a student-written play festival, and two improv events. Reading can truly be proud of the commitment, this commitment to the arts, and I encourage all of you to attend any of our student fine arts performances. At the state level, the Reading Public Schools looked, are looked upon as a leader in best practices for several initiatives that focus on teaching and learning. This past year alone, our teachers, administrators, and students have presented at several national, state, and regional conferences. In addition, several school districts have visited our classrooms to see best practices in action. In the last eight months, United States Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan and Massachusetts Secretary of Education Matthew Malone have visited our school district to recognize and honor our district's commitment to excellence. Our teachers and students are transitioning to the higher expectations and rigor of the new literacy and mathematics frameworks. In grades K through six, teachers use, are, are in the process of implementing a new math program, which focuses on the problem solving skills necessary so that more students will be taking advanced math, co math courses in the future. Middle and high school math teachers have been participating in professional development opportunities, which change the way math is being taught in our classroom. Our elementary and middle school teachers have also been focused on strengthening our students' ability to write, communicate, and process nonfiction material. Each of these initiatives will be raising the expectation level for all students and help prepare them for more challenging coursework and revise state assessments this year and in future years. An integral part of our mission is for all of our students to participate in the meaningful community service projects. Our service projects have such programs as our Veterans and Troops Overseas, Habitats of Humanity, the Reading Senior Center, Reading Cares, the Reading Food Pantry, Rosie's Place, Mission of Deeds, Animal Rescue Club, ALS, Cure for Alzheimer's, Cleft Palate Surgery for Infants, the American Heart Association, Coats for Kids, and Project Red. We are also proud of the work that continues to be done in the finance and operations branch of our school district. Our staff takes great pride in maximizing every dollar our community invests in our schools. In July of this year, the Center of American Progress updated a report that they first released in 2011 on the district by district analysis of educational productivity. This project develops a set of relatively simple productivity metrics in order to measure the academic achievement that a school district produces relative to its spending, while controlling for factors outside of a district's control, such as the cost of living and students living in poverty. 
I am pleased to announce that Reading has the fourth highest educational productivity rating in our Commonwealth. This strong measure is due to prioritizing our resources in the classroom and practicing strong fiscal management practices. I would like to recognize the work of our entire staff in committing to this practice and to thank our new Director of Finance and Operations, Martha Seibert, for continuing the strong fiscal practices that have become the norm in our school district. Finally, I want to take a moment and recognize the efforts of our building principals and central office administrators, many of who are here this evening. This dedicated, hardworking group of individuals consistently goes well beyond their job description in leading our schools through some very challenging times. I want to welcome our two newest administrators to the district, our high school principal, Adam Bacher, and our director of student services, Carolyn Wilson, both have provided visionary leadership and a new energy to the respective areas. Through their entry plans, they have talked to hundreds of staff, parents, and community members who have given them an overview of the strengths of our Reading community as well as our hopes for the future. As I mentioned earlier, we have a lot to be proud of in our schools. However, there are also some areas that we need to address so that we can maintain the level of excellence that we have taken pride in over the last several years. Addressing these areas will be critical to the long-term success of our school district. Our most recent challenge has been our declining MCAS scores and the designation of the Joshua Eaton Elementary School as a level three school and consequently our district being designated as a level three district by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Although this designation is based solely upon state assessment results, the process that we are now embarking upon will provide us with an opportunity to review every aspect of what we are doing at Joshua Eaton and in our district to effectively address the needs of all our students. To that end, I announced earlier today that I have designated Assistant Superintendent Craig Martin to lead a task force of parents, teachers, and administrators to oversee this important school improvement process. Although there, this is a significant challenge facing the Joshua Eaton School in our district, I want to unequivocally say that we will address this challenge successfully by tapping the collective efforts and talents of our entire school district, as well as our community. Another challenge we are currently facing is early childhood education. For the last three years, the Reading Public Schools has been working towards providing publicly funded full day kindergarten for all students, a program that is currently being offered in 242 other Massachusetts communities, already nearly 75% of the state, and it is increasing annually. To reach this important goal, the Reading Public Schools has been actively researching solutions to address classroom space, shortages for our growing preschool, providing full day kindergarten for all our students, improving our special education programs, and establishing dedicated art and music classrooms. As we discussed last spring at town meeting, we have reviewed several options over the past three years, and at this point, none of the options have been feasible for our community. In response to the feedback that we received last spring, the school committee has formed an early childhood space needs working group of elected and appointed officials, educators, parents, and community members to review possible space options using an open meeting process. This dedicated group of 21 individuals is committed to recommending a solution to our community that is educationally sound and fiscally responsible. Another area of focus has been the behavioral health and safety of our students. We are seeing some positive trends in the latest youth risk behavior survey data, where there is decreased use of alcohol and marijuana among our high school students. Unfortunately, our data also indicates that there has been an increase in the use of opiates, such as heroin, metamphetamines, and cocaine. We have also seen an increase in students doing harm to themselves, including attempting suicide. Although these increases are not just isolated to Reading, we are concerned that the number of incidents in Reading is higher than the state average. As a community, we have taken significant steps to address these increased concerns through World Cafe conversations, collaboration with the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, and your support in previous budgets with programs and staffing that supports behavioral health. In addition, the Town of Reading and the Reading Public Schools have recently received three federal grants totaling $1.95 million to help address the overall behavioral health of our youth. The first grant continues the great work that our CASA Executive Director Erica McNamara 
outreach coordinator Julianne DeAngelis and the rest of the coalition have done over the last several years and expands it for at least the next five years. The second grant will allow the Reading Public Schools to train 584 school educators, school support staff, first responders, youth workers, and faith leaders in youth mental health first aid, which is used to identify, understand, and respond to signs of mental illness and substance use disorders in our youth. The third grant will implement a highly sustainable, multi-tiered system of supports to improve school climate and behavioral outcomes for all our students. These three grants ensure that we will be able to move forward in creating structures, systems, and processes throughout our community to reach and engage all of our youth, particularly those youth who may be vulnerable to risky behaviors such as substance abuse or creating harm to themselves or others. These initiatives combined with the work that we have done over the last several years in school safety with the Reading Police and Fire Departments places our community as a leader in proactively addressing the overall safety of our children. As we all know, if students do not feel physically and psychologically safe at school, they will not learn, no matter what curriculum, technology, or teacher you put in front of them. I would like to thank the Reading Police and Fire Departments and the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse under the leadership of Chief James Cormier, Chief Greg Burns, and our CASA Executive Director Erica McNamara for the partnership that they have forged with the Reading Public Schools over the last several years and their leadership and efforts in creating safe and supportive environments for our children. Finally, I'd like to spend a few minutes focusing on school funding, past, present, and future. The visual behind me shows the ranking of our per pupil expenditure of the Reading Public Schools since 2006. As you can see, our per pupil ranking compared to other communities has been in steady decline. One major driver of this decline is the revenue available to town and school budgets each year. It is well documented that our community has a revenue challenge as we become more and more reliant on cash reserves each year to fund our budgets. It is to our town's credit that through mutual respect and collaboration, town boards have stretched our dollars to provide the quality education and services of which Reading is so proud. However, there is another piece to the funding puzzle that is now getting more and more attention, and that is the Chapter 70 Foundation Formula, which has had only a few minor adjustments since its creation in 1993. This formula is based on an outdated model that did not take into account future changes that have been made over the years in technology needs, increased learning time for students and different staffing needs, and in addition, special education costs are grossly underfunded in the foundation formula. Health insurance, insurance costs are double the amount that are allocated in the formula. Salary allowances in the foundation budget are well below actual salaries of staff and increased resources to address the needs of high poverty, English language learners, and homeless students are not captured in the formula. State government is finally listening, and a task force has been created by legislative action to review the Chapter 70 funding formula. Hearings are being scheduled throughout the state, and the task force has to report back to the legislature by next June. Although this will not affect the FY16 budget, there is promise that positive change could be made. Please attend the hearings and have your voices be heard. Our continuing decline in per pupil expenditure is beginning to have an effect on our school system, especially during the times of transition that we are currently facing. We are in the midst of tremendous educational change in our state and in our country with a new set of curriculum frameworks, a new state testing system, and a new teacher evaluation system that is tied to student performance. During these times of transition, additional supports are needed to help our students, our teachers, and our administrators adjust to the higher expectations in a timely manner. It is also important to retain our best educators and compete for the highest quality candidates for those educators who leave our district. While each district's per pupil spending may be impacted by varying needs, what is evident has been our inability to sustain what have been effective levels of services from year to year. What we are funding is that what we are finding is that in the last several years, we are losing ground and finding it harder to compete with comparable communities. In this way, I believe we are at a crossroads with our community, in our community. In conclusion, our district will continue to stay focused on the academic 
social, emotional, and behavioral well-being of our students. Each of the initiatives that I have mentioned this evening takes time, resources, and support, but when accomplished, will improve our schools, prepare our students, and establish Reading as an innovative leader in our region. While we are proud of the fact that we are a district that is on the forefront in many areas, we have many challenges that lie ahead, including educational space needs, funding for full-day kindergarten, making the transition to a more rigorous curriculum, and improving the social and emotional well-being of our students. The increasing accountability demands on public education and the needs of our students have increased significantly over the last five years. And we need to identify additional resources and restructure existing resources so that our teachers and administrators can continue to do the hard work necessary to improve student learning. We need resources to create more opportunities for teachers to collaboratively work together, to share their work and improve their practices, and to provide instructional coaching support so that our teachers can see firsthand what it looks like in the classroom. As we begin to develop the FY16 budget, these are areas that we will have to prioritize. I do believe that this is an exciting but uncertain time in public education. And we have an opportunity to make positive, substantive changes that have not been made since education reform was introduced in 1993. It is difficult work, but we are up to the challenge of providing the best learning experiences for our students. I am proud of the work that our teachers and administrators do every day to improve teaching and learning in our district, and I am excited by the enthusiasm and respectfulness of our students who arrive to school every day eager to learn. This is a testament to our parents and our community who value the importance of education and the role that it needs to play in a community. There is no question that a major indicator of the quality of life for everyone in a community can be measured by the quality of its schools and by a community's commitment to its children. In this way, the quality of a school district affects every single person in a community, and the town of Reading is no exception. But I also believe that this is one of our greatest strengths. Thank you for your time this evening. In my 32nd year as an educator and my 28th year in a row in Reading, and a parent of children who attended the Reading Public Schools, one who graduated last year, I must say that I am very so proud to be a part of this community. I thank you for the privilege, and I look forward to working with you as together we continue to make Reading a place where all students can learn and succeed, a place where we develop the innovative leaders of tomorrow, and a place where our schools continue to provide the strong foundation for the future of this great community. Thank you. Next is a report of the uh, Charter Review Committee. This will be very brief as I gave a more complete report in September. The work of the Charter Review Committee continues and we are on schedule to present our findings for a vote at a special town meeting set for January. That will allow us to place any approved changes on the April ballot for town-wide town approval. We've had several meetings and two public forums. We plan to take a final vote on November 24th and send the document to the Board of Selectmen for inclusion in the warrant. A running doc document of proposed changes can be found at the town website. Next is our uh, permanent building committee. Uh, Mr. Crook. Stephen Crook, chair of the uh, bylaw committee. Another brief report on uh, the bylaw committee's progress on the permanent building bylaw. At last winter's special town meeting, an instructional motion was made by the made instructing the bylaw committee to look into creating a permanent building committee bylaw. The bylaw committee is currently at draft revision two. This draft would create a five-member permanent committee. When a building project is proposed, addition of several additional project-specific members may be appointed by the sponsoring agency. The committee would be responsible for building projects in excess of $2 million, and this draft is currently being reviewed by town council. The bylaw committee expects to meet again soon after the adjournment of this town meeting to finalize the proposed bylaw. <laughs> it's our plan to present the final version at the January 2015 special town meeting. Thank you. Report, Mr. Doxa. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, fellow board members, town meeting members. At the September town meeting, this body passed Article 14, requesting FinCom use its investigative powers 
to review procurement, I put a tongue twister, procurement and specifically asset disposition activities and practices of RMLD and other town bodies and to offer an interim report to this town meeting. Since that time, FinCom has established a subcommittee to determine how to review these and investigate these activities. The subcommittee members have experience ranging from participation and management in general and forensic audits as well as municipal finance. The subcommittee has met in open meetings on multiple occasions and interviewed municipal CPA firms for their advice on how to scope and manage this type of investigation. Our focus is both on the activities that have taken place as well as how to prevent them from happening in the future. We're proposing to review these matters in three phases. Phase one is to review the specific RMLD transactions related to the three trucks. Phase two is to determine the scope of potential sales of surplus property for all town departments, the school department, and the RMLD. Phase three would be to perform limited compliance testing for select activities and compare them against best practices. Based on these results, the chosen CPA firm would provide a recommendation to either stop testing or to expand the scope for additional testing based on the risk assessment. In compliance with Chapter 30B regulations regarding procurement of services that can only be provided by CPA firms, we plan to interview and obtain quotes from at least three firms to achieve this scope. We hope to accomplish this in the coming weeks. We will then ask full FinCom for approval, and then we will approach the FinCom Appointment Committee for funds for this activity. Our plan is to move one phase at a time. Should we decide to perform all three phases, and provided that we do not need to expand testing due to any issues uncovered, we anticipate total costs not to exceed $35,000 for all three phases. Thank you. Mr. Arena moves that we lay the substance of Article 1 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed, motion carries. The business of Article 2 uh, instructions is now before the town meeting. Uh, Ms. West moves that we lay the substance of Article 2 on the table. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. Business under Article 3. Mr. Relasher. Thank you, Mr. Moderator, town meeting members. Um, once again, Article 3 is to revise and update the capital plan. It doesn't spend money. Since uh, this body met in September for a special town meeting, most of the heavy lifting was already done. We do have just a couple of small changes. There's a, a $30,000 request from the school facilities to have a look at the retaining wall. If you haven't noticed, the stairway out in front by the Veterans Memorial Wall has some tape on it because it's possible that there's some structural damage in a portion of that wall. So this $30,000 assessment would uh, let us know the scope of that. And then there's a request to add 14,000 to make a total 54,000 for a high school water heater that's needed. In addition, there's just a cosmetic change to reclassify on the capital plan, uh, something that's already been approved uh, previously in September. And as you can see behind me, there's a couple of requests for FY16 that we'll get to uh, certainly at annual town meeting. Um, that's, the, that's all that there is in Article 3. Um, right now, FY16 is probably not balanced. We'll do that either in January or uh, April uh, next year. Income report, Ms. Perry. The Finance Committee convened October 9, 2014, and voted 600 to approve the subject matter of this article. Is there further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. The business of Article 4 is now before the body, improvement or payment of uh, prior year's bills. Uh, Mr. Sexton moves that we indefinitely postpone the substance of Article 4. Is there a second? Second. I'm assuming that's because we have no prior bills? Right. Okay. Is there further discussion? None appearing. All those in favor of indefinite postponement, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion carries. The business of Article 5 is now before the town meeting, amending the fiscal 2015 budget. Uh, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, last September, town meeting approved a number of capital items. We just added the, the bottom three to that list. 
The total is now $724,000 of capital requested in the middle of the year. That's a little bit high, but you'll see on the next page we have some good news. We also have a, a housekeeping accounting issue. We are asking to increase uh, two line items in the community services budget. This is our first example where we're actually the host community in a regional position. Normally we're just paying our share through an expense line, but now we have other communities paying us. That was the final deal. So this represents their money that'll come into us and then be paid to an employee. Now let me get to the next page to show that. The um, 46750 from these other communities offsets that amount I just showed you on the prior page. But in red, there is one change from what was in your printed warrant report. It's in the motions this way. Um, but after the, uh, the report went to press, the assessors uh, had the new uh, tax rate certified by the DOR after doing cl tax classification through the selectmen. And very happy to see that uh, we had another $340,000 of new growth. A lot of that was commercial. And when I say commercial, I also mean uh, large-scale residential. Um, so that of the 770,000 that we're requesting, uh, only 280,000 of it has to come from, from free cash. So that's kind of a nice accomplishment. Um, otherwise, there's, there's no significant changes to anything in, in the warrant report. Ms. Gensminger? Put that last slide up just there. That says 905. So it says uh, 095. That should be 095. Yeah. <coughs> Next slide, please. All set. All set. Yeah. That's income report, Mr. Leidegger. At the FinCom meeting on October 9th, the Finance Committee recommended this article by a vote of 6-0-0. Further discussion? Yes, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. Since we're talking about the operating budget for fiscal year 15, I'd like to know where that money that the FinCom wants for their investigation is coming from, and who's approving that? Mr. Gillahan? Um, the way our charter is set up right now, uh, the moderator approves that. Once the uh, Charter Commission finishes it work, its work, depending on when that happens, if it goes to the voters and they still haven't spent it yet, there's a new three-person body uh, meant to decide that, but right now it's the moderator. And right now, the moderator would use the FinCom Reserves Fund, which has $150,000 in it. The moderator approves the expense yes. of the FinCom. OK, thank you. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we ready for the vote? All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? And the motion under five is accepted. Uh, business under Article 6 is now before the town meeting. Uh, Mr. Lalasha. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm taking a page from our planning department that shows you nice things of before and after. This has nothing to do with Article 6, but I just like the comparison. <laughs> In Article 6, the before, I'm sure most of you have seen the upside down or sideways shopping cart in front of Longhorns. It doesn't look quite as unattractive in the winter when some of it's covered by snow, but that's our bus shelter right now. This is really not what we had in mind when we bought the bus shelter. It's still not assembled. It's still located at the DPW yard on a trailer. To take town meeting through a little history which you've played some role in, in 2012, the Walkersbrook area's uh, businesses were thrilled to hear about our plan to actually buy, with our own money, a bus shelter and locate it on Walkersbrook Drive. Uh, and, then, and again, to, an important point, it serves both the customers and the employees of many of these businesses. In January of 2013, town meeting authorized the selectmen to an accept an easement. In March of 2013, all local approvals were received. 
uh, Mark Dickinson as well as Stop and Shop locally agreed, and they refer referred the matter to the, to the Dutch, to Royal Ahold. They needed, as they said, one final signature. One final signature has proved to be very elusive. In August, we gave them one last chance, or I should I say, say I gave them one last chance, that we would immediately take this matter to town meeting and seize it by eminent domain if they didn't comply. You didn't hear anything. Um, again, we've since talked to the property owner as well as the local authorities. They're fine with this course. Indeed, the selectmen did very threatening,ly with a menacing look, close this on the warrant. They they still didn't seem to mind. So here we are today, actually proposing to take this through eminent domain. The map's a little hard to read. It's it's in your booklet. Effectively, what we're doing is putting a little bus shelter right in front of Stop and Shop. Originally, the town wanted to put it where the grocery cart is, since that's where the bus stops. Um, <laughs> those businesses were not interested in putting a bus shelter there, whereas Stop and Shop and, and the owner in particular was very interested. So we're confident that the bus will actually stop where the shelter is, if we should be able to move it there. But this is what the shelter will look like if and, if and when we're ever able to assemble it. So again, what, what I'm asking a uh, town meeting to vote on here is to take uh, by eminent domain an easement to be able to put this shelter up. CPD's report, Mr. Hanson. Okay. Further discussion? Not appearing. Are we? Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Martin. Jamie Mullen, Precinct 4. Uh, what is the town paying for this uh, easement? I think a dollar that's in my wallet, but no more than that. And this has been discussed with the property owner, and this is the far yes. fair, mar far fair market value? Um, I think if it was willing, the property owner would pay us to put it up. Um, really, it's a service for him and his customers right. as well as his uh, employees. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, on the aisle. Sasso. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Sasso, Precinct 2. I have to ask the question. Please tell me you spoke with the MBTA and they said that the bus will stop there after you put it up? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Does that mean it will? <laughs> Further discussion? Oh, yes. Mr. Coco. Richard Coco, Precinct 4. Thank you for bringing up the MDTA, because it sounds to me like that's their responsibility, not the town's. And once we have that structure built by our money, then we're responsible for keep up, up, upkeep and any damage, any injuries that occur there. So I can, I'm not going to vote for this for that reason. Thank you. Further discussion? None appearing. Are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote, so I will ask for uh, four counters. Mr. Brown, would you take my right as well as the Finance Committee? Mr. Crook, would you take the uh, center aisle? Mr. Rushworth, would you take uh, over here? 
And Ms. Russell, would you take your section plus the Board of Selectmen? All those in favor of the motion, please rise. Thirty-six. Thirty-six. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Forty-one. Forty-one. Forty-seven. And those opposed, please rise. Two. 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 Two, two, zero. Zero. Vote being 148 in the affirmative and four in the negative, the motion carries. At this point, Mr. Arena moves that we take Article 9 out of order. Is there a second? Second? Is there any discussion? All those in favor, please raise your hands. Those opposed, the motion carries. The business of Article 9 is now before town meeting. Mr. Blodgett. I'm going to invite Everett Blodgett up. Here he uh, Everett's a non-town meeting member, if we might have permission to speak. But he is a uh, committee chairman. He is. I'd ask you to be patient with me. This is relatively new, and it's a little nervous being back in this building after 11 years out. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Good evening to all board and uh, committee and uh, commission members, uh, all town meeting members, and special guests. Um, as chair of the West Street Historic District Commission and representing the Summer Ave Local Historic District Study Committee, I'll be showing you a brief PowerPoint presenting uh, presentation that will give you a basic information about the proposed Summer Ave District. Uh, there is information available in your report to the warrant, 19 to 22, at your leisure. You might want to uh, pick that up and read that uh, at some particular point. With the passage of the local district bylaw and establishment of the West Street Historic District, almost 10 years ago, it was anticipated that other districts would gradually be created to help town protect the town's character, defining structures and neighborhoods. As proposed, the Summer Ave Local Historic District will recognize a residential neighborhood of prominent homes, most of which were built in the middle to late 1800s by well-to-do Boston-based merchants who served, who desired to live outside the city and chose the residents to be in Reading. The variety of homes that were built reflect the wealth and prominence of the original owners. Only a few contemporary homes have been built where larger lots were subdivided. Summer Ave is considered an intact neighborhood where homes are well set back on deep lots that reflect an attractive tree-lined streetscape worthy of the added recognition and protection that a local historic district can provide. Need help? <laughs> Any you do? There we go. This technology stuff. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Over 120 cities and towns in Massachusetts have recognized the value of historic districts and have established one or more districts within their communities. All are formed under the Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40C. Nearby communities that have local historic districts include Andover, Melrose, Woburn, Lexington, Concord, and Swampscott. With the establishment of the Summer Ave Historic District, Reading will be able to offer greater preservation protection 
to additional properties. This is a map of the proposed district. It starts at the corner of Summer Ave. Maybe I can point that out too. Oh, I'm not on the right thing, am I? Here we go. That's all right. The laser thing is. <laughs> wow, it's just like home. Uh, um, laser tag, who's going to get it? Okay. Um, so that's down here. Um, oh, we're off again. <laughs> down here on Summer Ave. Uh, and. Uh, Moving Street and progresses up here to Glen Road, uh, which includes, uh, so that it would meet up with 146, which we refer to as Wisteria Lodge. The master plan for the town of Reading states, and I'll quote, the character and identity of the community preserved up to today is potentially threatened by the changes within the existing fabric changes driven by forces outside the realm of the town's influence and sustained by the regional housing crisis. The human-friendly balance among building size, lot size, and natural elements that exist throughout the town is put to the test by external factors in Reading, thus threatening the sense of distinctiveness maintained throughout the years." Unquote. Of the 25 properties included in the proposed district, 10 of them are on the town's historical and architectural inventory, and five are recognized as National Historic Register properties. The National Register designation is just an honor. It places no restrictions or protection on the property. Inclusion on the town's inventory means that the Historical Commission may impose a six-month delay, demolition delay, but that does not prevent demolition. The overarching benefit of a local historic district is the protection of significant buildings from demolition and inappropriate alteration. The guidelines on establishing local historic districts uh, from the Massachusetts uh, Historical Commission requires specific actions for the implementation of a district. According to their guidelines, if a lo local district is already established in a community, then the commission which oversees it may act as the study committee. The West Street Historic District Commission agreed to take on the task. We identified the boundaries of the new district and submitted the preliminary reports to the Massachusetts Historical Commission and the CPDC. The report was received by the Massachusetts Historical Commission uh, at its October 8th meeting and voted to, quote, encourage the town of Reading to establish the Summer Ave Local Historic District, unquote. The survey was sent to home, a survey was sent to homeowner, homeowners as well as an informational letter which was followed up by a question and answer session which was held on September 17th. The survey results and comments shown an overwhelming support for the establishment of the proposed district. On December, uh, October 27th, a public hearing was held. Over 120 people attended, expressing their very positive support. A favorable vote by town meeting will be followed by a submission of the final report package to the Attorney General Office, to Attorney General's Office for review. The same bylaw, 7.3, which was created for the West Street Historic District will be used for the Summer Ave District. What is the reason for that was it allowed us a very uh, proficient process to create the bylaw. Once a district is created, only external features visible from a public way are subject to review, not the use of the property. Local historic districts do not prevent all change from occurring. The intent is to guide appropriate changes and additions through a local decision-making process. The purpose of the local historic district is not to halt growth, but to allow for a thoughtful consideration of, 
of Chang. It was shown, it has shown, been shown that local historic districts enhance property value and instill pride in the neighborhood and the town. I think I have. In conclusion, the Mass Historical Commission's guidelines for establishing historic districts states, local historic districts are about making sure our historic built environment maintains a, a varied part of the community. That protection is accomplished through the local democratic process of town meeting." Unquote. We have a big gun report first, and then, uh, excuse me, a bylaw committee report. I'm sorry, Mr. Clerk. Stephen Crook, chair of the bylaw committee. The bylaw committee voted 4-0-0 at their meeting of October 21st to recommend this article. Next, a board of select report. Ms. West. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, at, at the meeting of uh, October 28, 2014, the Board of Selectmen voted in favor of this by 4-0-0. By, by uh, we did not vote on this earlier when we were closing the warrant because the public forum had not happened at that point in time. There was definitely a desire on the Board of Selectmen to hear the information that was being presented at that public forum. We found that there was an awful lot of support in this. We did not hear anything against it in terms of the information that we had, and so we did vote to support it. Thank you. Before we open up to uh, discussion, I will point out that there have been non-town meeting members that uh, indicated a desire to speak. Our bylaws state that they can do so after our town meeting members have spoken. But just keep that in mind if debate goes on and we, uh, we move to end debate. Further discussion? Ms. O'Neill? Sure. Isn't there a CPDC report on this? Is there a CPDC report on this? Ms. Delios? There is. Uh, please be advised that at a regularly scheduled meeting on November 3rd, 2014, the Community Planning and Development Commission, CPDC, reviewed the pre preliminary report for the proposed Summer Avenue Local Historic District. On a motion duly made and seconded, the CPDC voted unanimously, 4-0-0, to approve the Summer Ave Local Historic District report and recommend the adoption of the Summer Avenue Local Historic District to subsequent town meeting in November 2014. Thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bill Brown, Precinct uh, 8. Uh, just a point to, uh, before I get into the conversation on this, Mr. Moderator, I noticed one of the votes are 400. Zero, zero. There is no such thing as an abstention vote on the Roberts rules or on the town meeting times. It only goes to the uh, quorum being present. So I wish from now on you people would go by the rule book. Uh, I'm not going to support this article. I think and I feel that it's infringement upon people's property's rights to do on the piece of property as they see fit. And I have a question if I might. If this passes, how does it affect the present uh, building that's under proposed demolition? Can they or can they not proceed with that? I don't know if the town council or somebody else can ask answer that question. Mr. I, I, I hear he's threw up his arm, so I don't know if that means good, bad, or indifference. <laughs> but we're, we're paying tonight, so I'd, I'd like a nice answer, one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs> one price fits all. Um, So uh, the property in question is currently uh, the subject of a demolition delay, uh, which I understand will run out approximately in January. If this uh, bylaw amendment uh, is adopted tonight, it does not go into effect until, as noted, it does not go into effect until the Attorney General approves it. 
and then it comes back in, and, and then it has to be recorded at the Registry of Deeds, and that's when it goes into effect. If that occurs before the demolition delay expires, then it will be applicable to that property. If, it, if that occurs after the demolition delay expires, then um, the demolition uh, permit can be issued. Well, thank you. Further discussion? Mr. Diderio. Uh, Ron Diderio, Precinct 6. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Uh, as far as I know, uh, I read the um, architectural, the architecture's report from the developer, and it stated clearly that they they do not intend to demolish the building, and they do they do not intend to demolish the house nor Mr. the Diderio, garage. The, oh, I'm the, sorry. Yeah, the um, the motion before is, is to create the district. We're not talking about any specific property. Okay. Um, I as a town meeting member, I can say uh, I got more uh, input from my neighbors on this subject than I have ever gotten, and every one of them is has asked me to support this article. Um, <clears throat> my feeling is that, as uh, Mr. Blodgett said, the area is really, um, I think it's a real important area in our town. Um, the street, a couple of years ago, was voted sort of like one of the best streets in New England. Um, so it seems to me that the neighbors certainly have a right, I think, or at least we in the town, I think, need to give them a little bit of leverage to be able to control what comes into the middle of their uh, residential neighborhood. It's, it's not a whole lot. If you look into uh, the reading that, Mr. that we got in, our, um, in the booklet, Things that do not apply, what do not apply, it does not include control <coughs> of paint color, <coughs> roofing material color, mailboxes, flagpoles, window boxes, gutters, and it goes on. So it's not that the neighbors have a tremendous amount of control, uh, but they do have some control of the exterior to at least ensure that it fits into the neighborhood and keeps the neighborhood's characteristics intact. I think it's something, I mean, if we put ourselves in the place of having the possibility of a, a nonprofit educational facility sort of drop in the middle of our neighborhood, uh, I think at least we would want to have some control in terms of ensuring that it kind of fits. I've been in town meeting for a while, and we've had developers come in, and they're going to put up something, and I know I've asked a few times if they would try to stay within, you know, do certain environmental things, et cetera, and make it a, the building a little more sustainable. And the, the word was, yeah, we're going to do the best we can. And then that's the end of it. We don't see them anymore. We don't have any leverage unless it's within the law. So this, in this particular thing, it gives the neighborhood a le some leverage to, to ensure that its um, characteristics are maintained. So I, it's, I think we, we owe it to the neighborhood, and I would ask you to support this article. Thank you so much. Further discussion? Yes. Good evening. Jean Braski, Precinct 6. Um, I have a question about how this information is presented to new property owners. So if I go to sell my property to a new buyer, um, how is the fact that it's in this district, assuming this passes, presented so that the buyer of the, the property understands that there may be some restrictions on their home that they're purchasing that, that don't exist in other areas of town? Is there a mechanism for that? Mr. Meares. Actually, is the um, that's the reason why the historic district 
has to be recorded at the Registry of Deeds, and it will be marked in such a way so that anybody who's doing the title search uh, on the property will see that uh, the historic district has been uh, adopted and that it, therefore they will be on notice that they have, uh, that they're subject to the terms of the bylaw. Mr. Blodgett. I can also add to that, uh, periodically we inform the neighborhood with a small brochure or something of that sort that tells, again, look at the characteristics, the bylaw, and informs them that they are in the National Historic District. I think we'd like to be able to do that more frequently. Um, I think it's something we should do more frequently. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Mon. Jamie Mon, Precinct 4. Just a couple of uh, informational questions. I assume the local historic district commission is appointed by the Board of Selectmen, is that correct? The answer is yes. It is. And if, um, is there an appeal process for either a denial or approval from the um, LHDC? Mr. Blodgett. At the West Street Historic District level, yes. And, and what is that appeal process? Uh, we've never had to experience that. I think it'll be a new, um, somebody, I can look that up for you right now. It's, we make a ruling that they're not in favor of. It's a, it's a general board that looks at that ruling and makes a decision one way or the other. And that's about all I can tell you. We've never used it in 10 years, approximately 10 years that I know of. Mr. Rensinger? Maybe I'm taking uh, Mr. Mayares's place in this answer, but uh, in our discussions, it was learned that the appeal process is to the MAPC, who I think undergoes some sort of arbitration. Is that right? <laughs> Mr. Mayares? And then after that, there's a further appeal to Superior Court. Which is? Superior Court is the answer? Okay, thank you. Further? After the MAPC, okay. Further discussion? I thought I saw a hand. Yes. Mr. Greenfield? David Greenfield, Precinct 5. Uh, better, better. Uh, I've had the uh, I've had the pleasure of um, being involved in the O N eight six seven preservation group for the last couple of months, and it's been um, it it's been uh, good to see the town come together and be united on uh, a common front, which is believing in the historic homes that we have and believing in the neighborhoods that we have. It's been good to see that the actual neighbors within the district voted overwhelmingly uh, to support this. I think we need as a town to show our overwhelming support to those community members in the district and go further than that, but to send a message that this is a Reading neighborhood, and we stand behind our neighbors. Um, and we, uh, they're, they're asking for our support, and I would ask for overwhelming support here. Thank you. Further discussion? I thought I saw that. Yes. Ms. Binda? Angela, Angela Binda, Precinct 5. Um, I'm going to support this article, and the residents are trying to preserve their neighborhood. Um, what I like about this is that it's different from other uh, historic preservation efforts that sometimes people have objections to because this is something that has really been initiated by the neighborhood. So even though there have been thoughts of this in the past, it's really been initiated um, by the neighbors themselves who are asking for not what might be considered an infringement upon their property rights but they're asking about protection for their investment, protection of their neighborhood, and protection of the 
enjoyment and use of their property. So that's something that um, I think is, is different from other historic preservation efforts that sometimes people oppose. Um, I also think that um, we can support this too because there's discussion of financial that it could cause hardship. And it's been, um, and there's anecdotal evidence that, you know, you might lose buyers or something. But there actually is, um, there actually is hard, hard data and studies that have been done to show that being part of a local historic district actually has a positive impact um, on property values. And I'll just read from one study very quickly. The issues of local historic districts and the impact of property values is a concern to homeowners. The effects have been extensively studied using multiple methodologies. Um, and it has been shown that the results of these studies are remarkably consistent. Property values in local historic districts appreciate significantly faster than the market as a whole in the vast majority of cases, and they appreciate at rates equivalent to the market value in worst case. So simply put, historic districts enhance property values. Um, I see this a similarity to what happened in North Main Street a couple of years ago where uh, uh, there was land that was um, a property owner who was going to sell to a 40B and put up um, townhouses and the neighbors came together and it's not the same situation but they appealed to the board of selectmen um, to help them and and this is sort of what these neighbors are doing they're appealing to town meeting for a tool to help them preserve their neighborhood so I'm going to vote in favor of it and Ron it was um, Boston magazine the best streets to live on summer avenue was named one of the best streets to live on so I think we should keep some revenue, one of the best streets to live on. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, yeah, oh yeah, Ms. O'Neill. Mary Ellen O'Neill, Precinct 4. I just want to clarify that this um, article, which I strongly support, uh, does not impact the use of any property. This is not going to keep any developer out of Summer Avenue based on this alone. It won't prevent any sale of property or anything like that. It's strictly related to the structure and the appearance of the buildings on the street. It's a, you know, it's a, to me it's a small but very important thing that we can do to help, you know, preserve what we have. So thank you for your support of this. Further discussion? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Brian Walsh, Precinct 7. Um, I wanted to speak in support of this article. I wanted to say a couple of things. Um, first, as been, has been mentioned before, Summer Avenue is a part of our town that has been recognized as a, a great place to live, and I think we should be standing up and supporting that. Um, second, some comments have been made about uh, trying to protect the property rights of the owners in that district, and I would point out that it is the owners in that district that are overwhelmingly supporting this and asking for this measure. So I will support their request. Thank you. Further discussion? Yes, Mr. Wells. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Carl Weld, Precinct 7. Uh, far be it from me to stand in any homeowner's way voluntarily giving up some of their property rights. Um, when it comes to historical preservation, though, it always seems to be a one-way street that, you know, the town is the one essentially doing the taking here. I'd like for just once the town to have a little skin in the game and perhaps we can start thinking about if we're going to be really serious about historical preservation, then let's offer a historical preservation tax credit and put our money where our mouths are. Thank you. Was there a hand down here for the discussion? Oh, Mr. Tucci. Thank you, Ken Tucci, Precinct 8. If we were to approve this and it goes into effect, how would it impact a property owner who wants to put an addition, say, on an on a existing um, building there? 
So for example, what if someone wanted to make an addition that connected the uh, existing home to an existing detached barn? How would that be reviewed or what, what would be the impact there? Purely Mr. hypothetical. Mr. Budget? Uh, would make a difference on the building. Uh, buildings under 70 years, uh, generally exempt, uh, unless the addition exceeded 25% uh, of the uh, expansion on the building. Um, an older building, it's under review, uh, and it would have to fit certain guidelines. I would point out that the one big advantage of this is it's governed by people that own property here in Reading. Um, there are people that have been on the West Street, and I see a lot of signs up there for it. Um, answering that question, it then becomes a discussion about what are you going to do about the windows? What are you going to do about the roof line? What are you going to do about the rake? You know, it's, it's quite a learning process. And I think it's to the advantage of the homeowner because their eyes become quite open that there are a lot of options available. Uh, the board has done a lot of learning. Um, but I think it's a, a learning process. Again, it's control by the people that are there from the town. And I think that's very, very important. And very important that West Street that's been there for 10 years now has half a dozen to 10 signs out of the 66 buildings there during the construction. <laughs> so it looks, to me, it's very strong, but it's very good. Further discussion? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. James Bonzoli, Precinct 6. I am in favor of this, and I'm so glad that the town is coming together for this as well. So I just encourage those who are, who have the lawn signs, to join the historic district. When I was on the board, there were three times that Rick Schubert had to step up and become a, a member of the historic district because we couldn't find anybody who was willing to serve. So if you're here tonight and you're in support, then please serve, because we, we, we need it. If you want to preserve it, then preserve it, not just your house, your neighborhood. Preserve the community and, and step up. Thank you. Further discussion? Uh, Mr. Greenfield? David Greenfield, Precinct 5. Uh, I just want to, uh, I believe in property rights as well. Uh, I be believe strongly in them. Um, however, we're about to go into discussions about town bylaws and zoning. Um, if you stack those impositions on our property rights next to this minor request, those are significant impositions. Those significantly encroach upon our property rights. But we believe in that. And we believe in it because it's reasonable that we have a responsibility beyond ourselves to each other. And so I think when you think about this, um, this is a reasonable um, infringement within the neighborhood, both because it's being requested and because of the nature of the historic neighborhood. So I would, again, vote for this, and I would encourage others to. Further discussion? Yes. Mrs. Mrs. Docker? Uh, Nancy Docker, Precinct 1. Could you s remind me again, how long has this home been on the National Registry? recognized as an historical home, not the district, but the actual home. Mr. Budget. Do you know? I don't know that I know that exactly. Um, during the bicentennial, shortly after that, I'm going to say about 1987, they began work on recognition of certain houses. So it's been more than 20 years? Yes. And okay. that's basically all of them. I happen to live in one of them. Okay. And, um, and so it's been a substantial period of time. I would point out again that there is no restrictions. No, I understand that. Budget. So I just want to understand because I'm going to vote to support this because I believe if you buy a historical home, you do have an obligation to the historical home. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Further discussion? 
Do we have anybody, any non-town meeting members that wish to speak? Oh, this is on, well, I'll call on you, I'll, I will come back to others, but uh, the gentleman in the back, sorry, whoever I missed. Thank you for recognizing me. My name is Bob Drake. I live at 176 Summer Ave. And my wife and I have lived uh, in the area that's proposed to be the, the new historic district. Uh, and we support this warrant. Uh, in fact, there are many people who live within the proposed district who also are here tonight and who also support the warrant. I'd ask you to stand. We, uh, we thank you. We ask for your support to adopt this, uh, this warrant tonight. Now, I had missed a town meeting member somewhere over here. Yes. Um, Cynthia Cool, Precinct 6. Um, I can't, I'm in support of um, article, this article, and I can't even imagine demolishing any part of this piece of property. It's just um, an amazement. It, it amazes me every time I pass by it. It's absolutely wonderful. And the neighborhood is beautiful, and the people are um, so happy with their neighborhood. It's just um, something that I can't fathom changing. It's just so, um, it's, it's just such a beautiful piece of property. Well, remember, we're talking about right. a district, not a To keep it, right, to keep it historic, I think, is um, extremely um, important and uh, valuable to the town, um, just to keep its character, um, to keep the history there. I'm in support for it. I hope everyone else is. Thank you. Further discussion? Again, is there anyone from a non-town meeting member? All right, are we ready for the vote? This requires a two-thirds vote. I'll ask the same counters if they could help out. All those in favor of the motion under Article 9, please rise. Thirty-two. Thirty-two. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Forty-six. Forty-six. And those opposed? Three. Three. Zero. One. One. Zero. Zero. The vote being 144 in the affirmative, four in the negative, the motion carries. Now, if you'd hold on just a second. For the learning curve, don't put your stuff in plastic. You can't see it with all these reflecting lights. It was from memory, folks. Mr. Arena moves that we take Article 10 out of order. Uh, is there a second to that? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? The motion carries. Uh, Mr. Arena moves indefinite postponement of uh, the substance of Article 10. Is there a second? Mr. Arena, do you have any comments? Mr. Lasher, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, uh, there's a written explanation as to the background of this, but today the town clerk has certified a petitioned article that will appear in January to accomplish the same task from over 100 registered voters. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Lasher. Sorry, and I should add that by postponing it into January, we can publicly notify all the property owners and have them in at a public hearing so they understand what this article would be about. Further discussion on the indefinite postponement? Not appearing. All those in favor of indefinite postponement, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. It is indefinitely postponed. Mr. Arena. Mr. Arena uh, moves that we adjourn until Thursday evening. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion carries. This town meeting stands adjourned until Thursday evening.